Good evening. I am Sarah Faye Martin, president of AAUW, and it is my pleasure this evening to introduce Professor Cindy Byes. Professor Byes is an accomplished scholar with many accolades and awards, but this evening we are focusing on her service to the community. She is a founder and director of the Immigration Detention Project at the SIU School of Law, which provides legal information to approximately 250 immigration detainees annually at the Pulaski County Detention Center. She also represents asylum seekers on a pro bono basis. She serves on the boards of Southern Illinois Immigrants Rights Project in Carbondale and the Immigration Project in Bloomington, Illinois, as well as the International and Immigration Law Section Council of the Illinois State Bar Association. She regularly leads educational programs for the community on various aspects of immigration law. Since 2015, Professor Byes has served on the Illinois Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, which has investigated issues on environmental justice, voting rights, and access to housing during that time period. She is a former president of the United Nations Association of Southern Illinois, which seeks to educate the community about the work of the United Nations and build support for its goals. She is also a proud Rotarian supporting Rotary service projects internationally as well as locally. Finally, she is a long serving memory member of the mission ministry of the First Presbyterian Church of Carbondale, which supports several local groups uh, that are nonprofit, such as the Women's Center, the Boys and Girls Clubs, and the Good Samaritan Ministries. She's also a member of the Carbondale branch of AAUW, and we are proud to honor her this evening. Cindy, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and welcome everyone. So glad that you could be here with us this evening. It's so fun when you take a trip and you learn lots of new things and you have the opportunity to share those things with people who are interested in hearing about them. So I'm excited to share with you my experience. I do have a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to share with you so you can see some of the pictures that I will be sharing with you this evening. So I will pull that up. There we are. So I wanna begin with a thank you really. Uh, last spring, I had the privilege to be on sabbatical from Southern Illinois University School of Law where I normally am teaching and am teaching now again this semester. And so the university was kind enough to grant me a sabbatical to allow me to do some uh, additional things that you, know, you don't have time to do when you are teaching full time. And in anticipation of my sabbatical, I reached out to some colleagues and through my network, I was uh, invited to teach at a university in Turin, Poland. It's called Nicholas Copernicus University. And I'm going to share my experiences there with you and some photography and some wonderful experiences and some th sad things about being there during the war in Ukraine. I actually signed my contract to go and teach at Nicholas Copernicus University about one week before the uh, latest major invasion of Russia into Ukraine in February of 2022. But pretty quickly, it became clear that I would be able to still go to Poland and carry out my obligations there, which I'm so thankful turned out to be true. So I flew into Warsaw, Poland, which is about a two hour drive from Turin. And because of flight delays, I didn't get into Turin at night. But one of my wonderful colleagues, Machi, picked me up at the airport and drove me to Turin. And on our way in, uh, we stopped across the Vistula River from Turin. And this was my first view of the city. 
Turin is a city of about 200,000 people that's located in the north central part of Poland. So as I said, it's probably about two hours north west of Warsaw and about two, an hour south of Gdansk, um, if that helps you to sort of orient where Turin is. Um, and my apartment here uh, that I stayed in is almost visible from this view. I stayed very close to the river in what's called the Old Town part of Turin. And I should say that we will leave time for questions and answers at the end. But if at any point while I'm talking, you think of something you want to ask, please feel free to put it in the questions and answers and we'll gather those up and try to come back to them all at the end. So this is Bridge Street. Uh, there used to be a bridge across the Vistula River that uh, connected right here at Bridge Street. And so this is where my apartment was in a building similar to what you see here on the left. And Turin is really famous for three things. Uh, the first of those things is its Gothic architecture. Turin was occupied by Germans during World War II which had pluses and minuses. Um, obviously there were some pretty serious disadvantages to that, but one positive thing is that the city was not bombed the same way that certain other parts of Poland were destroyed. And so much of the Gothic architecture from the 13th, 14th, 15th century is still standing in Turin. And so you can see just some examples of it here. A second thing that Turin is very famous for is gingerbread. And they have a gingerbread factory and you can go in and in addition to touring the factory and learning how they make gingerbread, uh, you can actually try your hand at it as well. And something that I did not know was that gingerbread's origins were not as food. Uh, if you leave out certain ingredients like the baking soda in gingerbread, it comes out to be a hard clay-like or ceramic-like substance. And so a long time ago, there were very elaborate molds made and they would put the gingerbread into the molds and it was wall art and it was very expensive. Only if you were quite wealthy could you afford this kind of art. And um, so it was found on the walls of wealthy residents in Turin and other parts of Poland and Europe. Later, of course, they started adding the baking soda and it became more of a treat that people eat. And if you go to Turin, you can try gingerbread cookies um, and you can try sort of the traditional ones that we tend to have here in the United States, but there they have them mixed with all kinds of things. They have chocolate and strawberries and, and all different kinds of flavors for their gingerbread cookies. And the third thing that Turin is very famous for is that it is the birthplace of Nicholas Copernicus. And on the left here, you see the statue of Nicholas Copernicus, which is in the town center of Old Town. And on the right is the Nicholas Copernicus house. So this is actually a house that he lived in while he lived in Turin. And you can also see on the left that Nicholas Copernicus's statue was draped in the Ukrainian flag. And this is something that I saw everywhere I went. Uh, there were Ukrainian flags flying outside of the Polish courthouses. There were Ukrainian flags on posters, on bus stops, you know, everywhere you went in Poland while I was there, you saw this kind of support for Ukraine. The university that I taught at, as I said, is Nicholas Copernicus University, and I was teaching in the School of Law there. They have a one-year program that is taught all in English that is in comparative law. And uh, so my students were all Polish students. They do have students from other European countries at Nicholas Copernicus University, but in my classes, I had all Polish students who had been studying English for some time and who took their courses in English. Um, and they were a wonderful group of students. I taught three courses. I taught one on uh, the US legal system, which was pretty much a mini constitutional law course. I taught a course on international business and I taught a course on negotiations. And then also did a little bit of guest lecturing in other classes and working with other colleagues while I was there. Um, and as I said, it was really a wonderful experience. I could not have asked for more welcoming students and colleagues and have continued to stay in touch with them and I'm continuing to work on some joint projects with them back here in the United States. 
So here are some of my faculty colleagues. On the left, we have the uh, essentially the dean, or they would call the rector and the, the vice dean. Um, and then on the far right, you see the faculty who were primarily people that I spent time with because they were all pretty fluent in English. Of course, not all the faculty there are fluent in English, but quite a few of them are, and they also teach in the comparative law program. So most of these faculty you see here are either scholars in uh, human rights law, in constitutional law, or in international and immigration law. And then in the center is a young lady um, who was a former student at the university who is now a faculty member at another university in Poland. And she was my um, connection, the person that helped me to learn about the program in the first place. So I want to turn now to a little bit more information about what was happening in Poland while I was there. Of course, Putin invaded um, Ukraine most uh, seriously in February of 2022. And Poland received a huge influx of Ukrainians who were fleeing from the bombing and the invasion of their country. Nicholas Copernicus University already had a number of Polish students um, at the university and a few Polish scholars, so there were people there already. Poland also had long, for some long time now, had some special visa programs for Ukrainians to come and work in Poland. So there were already a lot of Ukrainians in Poland. In fact, um, the young man who rented me my apartment, uh, his girlfriend who lived in Turin also uh, was from Ukraine, but had lived in Poland for a number of years. When the Russian invasion occurred and at the height of the uh, migration out of Ukraine, Poland received over 3 million Ukrainians in a very, very short amount of time, in less than a month. And the cities in Poland were incredibly welcoming. Virtually every city in Poland increased its population by about 10% almost overnight. So for a city of 200,000 people like Turin, that meant they had about 20,000 new people that they were trying to find housing for, to get kids into school, to find jobs for parents who could work. Most of the people who were fleeing from Ukraine were mothers with young children and uh, elderly people. If you were a male of fighting age, 18 and over, there was a presidential order from President Zelensky that you needed to stay in Ukraine and participate in the war effort. Um, but what that meant, of course, was that many of the Ukrainian men who had been working in Poland had to leave and go back to Ukraine. So what was left was sort of the, the moms and the children and the older folks. And even among the older folks, a lot of them did not leave Ukraine. Um, either they couldn't travel for physical reasons or they didn't want to leave their homes. Um, so it was interesting to me to see how many um, younger people and children there were among uh, what I refer to as the refugees from the war. Um, technically under international law, they may or may not qualify as refugees, but I think that's the term that the media is using for them. So one thing that the city did while I was there was they hosted a friendship picnic, they called it, in a local park. And um, they had set up booths with city services at the park. So if there were Ukrainians who needed to be connected to educational services or jobs or utilities or you know, housing or anything like that, there were booths at the park where they could go and get information. Um, but they also just provided free food. It was a picnic. They made like sausages and things like that. And then as you can see on the right, they had bounce houses for the children and face painting. And it was an opportunity for the Polish people and the Ukrainians and foreigners like me, because I wasn't the only uh, non-European uh, in town who could come together and spend a day getting to know one another. I will also point out on the far left of this slide, there is a woman with a white sweatshirt and kind of a gold colored vest with sunglasses on her head. And that's Tatiana. And Tatiana is actually a Supreme Court judge in Ukraine. Her home is in Kyiv. And when the war happened, she and her son, who is 13, fled to Turin. They had been to Turin before. They knew some of the faculty there. And so um, that was a place where they reached out to friends and they ended up spending a few months in Turin while the bombing of Kyiv was at its worst. Um, and so Tatiana was really the person that I got to know the best among all the Ukrainians. 
and who shared with me a lot about the difficulties, the uncertainties, the stress, the unknowns that the war had caused for her and her family and friends. While I was in uh, Poland, I was able to do some traveling. If you think back to last uh, March and April, uh, the time that I was there primarily was from the end of March until the end of May. We were still at a point where COVID was uh, a little bit more prevalent than it is now. And I was able to go, of course, with vaccinations and all of that, but it did make traveling a little bit more difficult. Um, and as an American, I had a different vaccine than many of the Europeans did. And my vaccine was not necessarily automatically accepted. So if I wanted to leave Poland to go to another European country, I had to jump through additional hoops in terms of getting retested and things like that. So I chose to do most of my touring uh, within the country rather than crossing international borders. But I'm really glad that I did um, because Poland is an absolutely beautiful country and there was far more than I could see in the you know, two months that I was there. But the first city that I visited was Krakow, uh, which is in the southern part of Ukraine. It's the second largest, or sorry, the southern part of Poland. It's the second largest city in Poland after Warsaw. And I was there because we had a long weekend over the Easter weekend. And if you know much about Poland, you know that it is a predominantly Catholic country. About 85 to 90% of the people are at least nominally Catholic in Poland. And uh, so they gave us you know, both Good Friday and Easter Monday off. So I chose to spend that long weekend traveling down to Krakow. And uh, this is sort of the central square in Krakow, uh, the old town area and St. Mary's Basilica, which is in that square. So St. Mary's Basilica, the outside of it is in the left um, photograph and the inside is in the middle. And so on Easter Sunday, I had the privilege of going inside and celebrating Easter mass at the uh, St. Mary's Basilica, which was um, just a stunning, cathedral. I am not Catholic, um, but I felt very privileged to be there and to accommodate everyone who wanted to attend Easter Masses there. They had Masses every hour starting about 7 a.m. until about 2 in the afternoon. So you would go in, they would hold Mass. 50 minutes later, they would dismiss you, you'd come out and the next group would come in and they'd have Mass again the next hour. Um, and so they had it down to a science. Also in Krakow, I spent quite a bit of time reflecting on what happened to the Jewish population during World War II. If any of you have seen Schindler's List, most of that was filmed in Krakow. And the building in Schindler's List that was the factory is now a museum of the World War II history and what happened to the Jewish people. And of course, the population of Jewish people was almost wiped out during the war. Um, there are probably less than 10,000 practicing Jews in Poland today, even though, you know, it's certainly a much more welcoming place. Um, but there is an active part of the city in Krakow where they are maintaining their Jewish history and heritage, where there are synagogues and restaurants and things like that. So some of these photos come from that part of the city in the Kashmir neighborhood. Um, it was really astounding to me. I mean, certainly I've read lots of books about World War II history, but the complete decimation of the population of Jewish people in Poland during World War II was pretty overwhelming. And even after the war, they said there were probably 60,000 left after the war. Many of them chose not to stay. Uh, it was still too painful. There was still too much resentment. Um, it was too difficult to make a life for them. And so that is why there are so few Jewish people uh, there today. And that was just a really sad thing to reflect upon. Everywhere I went, as I said, there were uh, reminders of the war in Ukraine. So that Easter weekend in the central square, there were Ukrainians and others who supported them who demonstrated uh, every day. And on this particular day, this was again, Easter weekend, 
these Ukrainians were particularly asking all of the tourists who were in Krakow for the Easter weekend to lobby their governments, um, to lobby NATO, to create a no-fly zone over Ukraine to help them with the destruction of their country that was going on at that time and, of course, continues to go on. Um, and so I stopped and listened and, and they did the presentation in English. And it's quite amazing that English is such a common language that, you know, I would run into tourists from Spain or Germany or other places. But, you know, the common language that many people spoke was English. On the right, we have World Food Kitchen that was set up at the train station in Krakow. Every train station that I was at in every city in Poland had resources for Ukrainians at the train station. And so uh, the city that I spent most time in, Torin, had a much smaller train station, of course, but they had one end of the train station that used to be the food court that they had turned over completely to an area for Ukrainians who were coming through on the trains to stop and be connected to resources. And in Krakow, they had turned their entire old train station into housing for Ukrainians. They have a newer facility there that was still where the trains were operating but next door, but the older building they had turned completely into basically dormitory style housing for the Ukrainians who were there temporarily. And then right next door to that, they had the World Food Kitchen set up where they could go for free meals. Also, a very beautiful city, of course, is Warsaw. Um, and these are pictures from my visit to Warsaw. Um, these are various parks, uh, a couple of pictures from the Old Town area, the castle south of Warsaw where the kings used to be. And then in the lower right-hand corner is basically the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, which reminded me quite a bit of the tomb that we have in, our, in Arlington National Cemetery. And um, I happened to be in Warsaw in early May at a time when they were celebrating both their Flag Day and their Constitution Day. And so there were special parades and ceremonies going on um, that were sort of nationalistic in nature and, and remembering you know, the war fallen. Um, and so it was a beautiful, beautiful time to be in Warsaw. But um, Warsaw and those pictures that you just saw has been completely rebuilt since World War II. The picture on the left is part of Old Town Warsaw that was destroyed from German bombing during World War II. There is a Warsaw Rising Museum uh, in Warsaw that I visited while I was there that tells the history of what happened in Warsaw. Um, there were really two uprisings in Warsaw. One was the Jewish uprising in the Jewish neighborhoods. The second was the uprising of the Polish people trying to fight out, fight off the Germans who were in the city. And there's a very sad story that the Polish National Army worked very hard and they did largely expel the Germans from the city at one point towards the end of World War II. They were expecting the Russians to enter the city and come to their aid and be reinforcements, but the Russian troops stayed on the outside of the city during that uprising. And the Polish National Army, though successful, took a lot of casualties, and there was a lot of resentment against the Russians for not coming in. But the Russians decided very calculatingly that they were going to allow the Polish people to take the brunt of that fighting. After the Polish National Army had liberated Warsaw, the Russians did come into the city and they called up all the Polish officers who were leading the troops and the Polish officers, of course, thought they were going to be commended for their effort. Instead, they were rounded up and taken out into the Katyn forest and the Russians executed all of them. They wanted to have Russian control over Warsaw and they did not want leaders from the Polish National Army to be there to fight against them. And so essentially after all that work that the Polish army put in, um, they were, you know, their leadership was obliterated and they were under Russian rule. And I could not help reflecting as I was watching, you know, international versions of CNN and um, other, European television stations there and watching the bombing of Mariupol and other Ukrainian cities, how much the images I was seeing were 
reflected in the historical pictures that I had been seeing of Warsaw and other parts of Poland during World War II. And so it really was quite a poignant reminder. So um, there's, these are two images that I took in Warsaw, again, uh, indicating the solidarity that Ukrainians have with the Polish people. Um, and again, I've just shared some figures. I spoke with a friend recently and also looked online and it looks like about a third of the Ukrainians who came to Poland since February have are still there, who have remained in Poland. You know, another, um, at least a third have gone back to Ukraine. Others have sort of spread out around Europe. This picture on the right of the Cool Cat Cafe, if you look closely on the bottom, there is a poster and it says, Dear Putin, let's speed up to the part where you kill yourself in a bunker. And so I think this kind of reflects the attitude of some of the Polish people towards uh, Mr. Putin and you know, what was happening in Ukraine at the time. Another city that I had the opportunity to visit was Gdansk. And if you know your history, you know that there was a solidarity movement uh, led by La Kulesa, uh, in Gdansk in the shipyards there in the northern part of the country along the Baltic Sea. That was really the spark that was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. And there is a solidarity museum there in Gdansk um, where you can tour and learn about the history of the laborers in the shipyards and what caused them to come together and fight for workers' rights, for freedoms, and how that then sparked you know, the movement towards Poland's independence and ultimately the independence of other countries in Europe. On the far right here, uh, at the sort of end of the museum tour, there's a, I wanna say a board, it's more like a wall, like a huge wall with these pegs and they have pieces of paper and visitors to the museum are encouraged to write reflections on what they saw while they were in the museum, write wishes for hope and peace, um, you know, whatever is moving you at the moment. And if you can read this, um, there were many messages that referred to Ukraine, solidarity with Ukraine, prayers for peace, um, things like that that were posted on the wall by various visitors to the museum. And I think it's really important um, to remember the connections between Poland and Ukraine. So why has Poland, why have the Polish people been so supportive of the Ukrainians during this crisis? And part of it really is this shared um, anger towards Russia. Of course, Poland was part of the former Soviet Union, as was the Ukraine. They were under Soviet control for many, many years um, and experienced many of the same things during World War II. And so that has brought about a certain level of solidarity between the Polish people and the Ukrainian people. That is not to say everything is perfect. There were Ukrainians who fought with the Russians and you know, killed Polish people during the war. And so there's been tensions off and on. But for the most part, there's a lot of cultural history, a lot of um, shared history where they can relate to one another and particularly in their anger against Russia. Um, this, these pictures I have on this slide are from a park that a colleague and I biked to and they call it Golgotha, meaning the place of the skull. And um, during World War II, one of the things that the Germans did, like the Russians and the story that I just told you about Warsaw, was they took the intelligentsia out into the forest uh, at this place and they shot them because they did not want leaders in their communities. So the college professors, the city council people, you know, the, the heads of businesses in Turin were all brought to this place in the forest just north of Turin and they were shot. And so there are memorials there to the people who were killed at that time by the Germans. And then when the Russians came in later at the end of the war, uh, much the same took place once again, not necessarily in the same place, but um, it was this pattern of taking out the people who were more educated, who were leaders, and you know, remembering that they have this shared history 
um, and that sometimes history is repeating itself. So I did learn just a few words of Polish while I was there. Uh, this says Dziękuję, uh, and I thank you for your attention. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have um, and to talk more about my time there, but I think I will stop sharing the PowerPoint and see if we can have more of a conversation at this time. Okay, Cindy, that was just fantastic. Uh, uh, covering all of the bases that you did. <laughs> we have one question, but I encourage the rest of you, uh, those of you who are uh, attending tonight to uh, uh, put some more questions into the, the Q&A. So let's go with the question that we have from Ella Lacey. She asked regarding the restrictions in, imposed on Ukrainian citizens in order to have younger men available to assist in fighting the war, did this restriction apply equally to university students at the front university, to law students, or were they get some special pri privilege to continue their studies? It's an excellent question. Um, initially, yes, the university students were expected to go back to Ukraine. But at some point while I was there, and I don't know the exact timing, there was a waiver that was offered to university students. So they could apply for a waiver to be able to continue their studies at the university and not go back and join the fighting forces in Ukraine. This was also a very, very stressful situation. Um, the Ukrainians who I met in Poland, many of them were feeling tremendous guilt that they were in a place where they had shelter and food and were not being bombed. And of course, all of them had friends and family still in Ukraine who were under much worse conditions. And the students were feeling this as well. They felt that if they took advantage of the waiver, they were somehow you know, shirking their duty um, and not participating in the war the way that they should with their friends and family members back home. Um, so on the one hand, they wanted to be safe, they wanted to complete their studies, but applying for the waiver also carried with it a lot of feelings of guilt and a lot of stress. Um, and so that was a very, very difficult decision for these young people. It's, it, it's so interesting to me to, to try to fathom the, the number of people that are coming, who are coming into Poland from Ukraine. And I was wondering, did you notice the impact of, on, on you from the, 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 and they were coming primarily by train, correct? Right? Mm -hmm, they were. Yeah. You know, did, did it impact you at all or the work of the university or other workplaces? Uh, can you talk a little more about day-to-day -day life? Yeah. So personally, no, it did not impact me very much at all. Um, as I said, the only thing was travel on the trains was sometimes a little bit more difficult, um, partly because of COVID, but partly because the trains were very crowded um, with Ukrainians and others. Um, so travel was a little bit more difficult, but honestly, I was very, very lucky. When I signed my contract with the university to go and teach, I was concerned that I would have trouble finding housing um, because so much of the housing was being used for the Ukrainians. Um, but I was very fortunate to find an apartment in Turin fairly quickly. And even that carried guilt, right? Because that's an apartment that could have been used by a Ukrainian family. Um, and so there were definitely limitations on resources. My sense from talking with both the Polish people and the Ukrainian people there was that the biggest hurdle was for the schools. They were trying to take hundreds or thousands of children and integrate them into the schools so that the children could continue their education, but they didn't speak Polish uh, and the teachers didn't speak Ukrainian. In some cases, they were trying to hire some of the Ukrainian parents, you know, who came over with the children to be teachers in the school. Some of them had been teachers in Ukraine before they came. But if they had young children, then they need a daycare. And like the United States, there wasn't sufficient good quality daycare for the Polish children, much less for the Ukrainian children. So there was a huge burden on the daycare system as well. There was initially a thought that, you know, many of these moms could come and fill some of the jobs that the Ukrainian men had been filling when the Ukrainian men went back to fight in the war. 
but the skill sets seemed to be quite different. Many of the jobs that the men had been holding were like truck driving jobs or construction jobs and not necessarily jobs that a lot of women through traditional gender roles had been trained for. So that didn't work quite as well as people had hoped. Um, I was just amazed at my colleagues there. I mean, there were lawyers there who were paying for apartments for Ukrainian families. Um, there were lawyers there who had opened up their own homes. They had a dozen people living in an apartment with them. Um, there were Ukrainian women who were cooking and selling food as a way to make money. And uh, I visited a couple of my colleagues' homes and their freezers were stuffed with pierogies because the Ukrainian women were making and selling pierogies and people were just buying trays and trays of them and freezing them just to provide you know, some income for the women who were trying to, to make some money. Um, I mentioned that I had, had the privilege of spending some time with Tatiana, um, who was the judge and her son. Many of the high school students actually, uh, if they were able to, were taking their courses online. So her son was actually still at home in their apartment that they were renting in Turin. And he was connecting every day with his classmates um, wherever they were. I mean, you know, they were, some of them were still in Ukraine. Some of them had fled to other countries. Some of them were other cities in Poland, but the teachers from the high school that he had been attending um, were holding online classes so that the teachers and students could stay in touch with one another you know, while they were undergoing this uh, diaspora. So um, it was just a whole variety of uh, issues. But I, you know, I think about our situation here in the United States with busloads of people being brought into various cities around the United States. And it's a lot, but it doesn't even approach what Poland took in in a month. Yes, and it's it is so amazing to me how it, 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 I would perceive it to be chaos with all of the people coming in, but and the the lack of organization and preparation for all of them. But it it's it's monumental, as you were just saying, that everyone was pitching in, pitching in to to help out. It really was a society-wide effort. Um, and many of the Polish people said to me, you know, don't give too much credit to the government. This is the Polish people that are doing this, not the government. <laughs> okay, we have a couple more questions here, uh, Cindy. So uh, what motivated you to travel to, uh, to Poland for your sabbatical? Like comes from Lynn Davis. So I am an international law specialist. Um, that's my field of study. And um, I think that it's really important for me to spend time in other countries and to learn other legal systems in order to enhance my own understanding of international law, foreign law, you know, operating in an international environment. Um, and so I was really willing to go almost anywhere in the world. <laughs> it just happened that I had a colleague in Poland and there was a program in Poland that needed uh, someone of my skills and that, you know, that matched up when it did. Um, so I didn't set out specifically to go to Poland, but it turned out to be a really fascinating time to be there. So I felt very, very lucky. Oh. And uh, another question from Heidi Coons considering residences. Were there many single family homes as we know them in the U.S.? Uh, uh, Gary, Indiana has a pierogi fest, he says, and uh, she as well as I enjoy the pierogi. So, so, so um, most of my colleagues lived in what I would think of as condominiums as opposed to single family homes. Uh, it probably varied. I mean, I was not out in the countryside very much, but certainly, you know, there's a lot of farming that happens in different parts of Poland where I think single family homes were more common. But in the cities where I was, it was more apartments and condominiums and that sort of thing. Although there were some single family homes, that was not the predominant um, style of, of housing in the cities. Um, I have to say that, you know, I, I will admit to a stereotype that I had studied as a student, Poland as part of studies of World War II and part of studies of the breakup of the Soviet Union. And having um, studied Poland, say in the 70s, 80s, 90s, in that time period, 
I still had the impression that there were a lot of Soviet influences on Poland, and I pictured it as more of a place that was a bit more gray, a bit more a monochrome, um, a bit more sort of the Stalinist sort of blocky architecture. Poland was not like that at all. Um, it was incredibly beautiful. They love to garden. Um, they have a lot of beautiful old architecture that has survived the wars. And so I was just uh, amazed by how beautiful it is and how different it was from my stereotypical impression. Very good. Well, I have one, one final question for you. And it has to do with the uh, what you were teaching uh, in, at the law school and whether or not there's any reciprocity between uh, that university and SIU law school. Uh, in, in, uh, do they normally have the types of courses that you were teaching? Do they have that as part of the curriculum? I mean, do they, do they have it listed? Yeah, so to answer your question about reciprocity, no, we do not have a formal arrangement with the law school in Poland, although it's possible that that might happen in the future. Mm -hmm. um, the legal system in Poland and the, the system of legal education is a little bit different. So you probably know that here in the United States, to become a lawyer, you normally do a four-year bachelor's degree, and then you go to law school and earn a Juris Doctorate degree, which takes another three years. In Poland, they study law as undergraduate students, um, but it is a five-year program, and then they have sort of an internship uh, you know, a, a tutoring, you know, under a practicing lawyer type of arrangement um, at the end of that. And so the students that I had were mostly what we would consider to be undergraduate students, um, but they were studying law as their undergraduate education and preparing to practice. Now, some of them were already working for firms because they were pretty close to the end of their program. Um, but it was a little bit different there. So that does create some issues when uh, we try to make these arrangements between law schools in the United States and law schools in other countries because the legal systems and the educational systems are set up a little bit differently. Um, but as I said, they were, they were fabulous. Um, I was so impressed with the students being able to take courses from an English speaking professor about, uh, you know, both the US legal system and, and the international legal system in English. Certainly the students' language skills varied. Some were quite fluent in English, some struggled a little bit more. Um, but they were uh, very brave, I think, to take a course or more than one course from a foreign professor whom they'd never met, you know, in a foreign language. Um, and so I really appreciated that they were willing to go out on a limb and do that. Well, a wonderful opportunity for you, that's for sure. And we, I'm so glad that you shared it with us. So with that, we thank you again, Cindy. We're proud to have you a member of our Carbondale branch of American Association of University Women. And we're going to turn it over to Joe Pichard now, who is our, our, our Vice President for uh, Program Development for the branch. Thank you, Marsha. Cindy, that was just wonderful. Thank you so much again for presenting us with that thought-provoking material. And thank you to everyone joining us this evening. We thought it might be helpful to share our program schedule for the upcoming year with you. And so before I review our monthly programs, I'd like to bring attention to a special program on October 24th, which is United Nations Day. Our branch is a co-sponsor of the program with the UN Association Southern Illinois Chapter. And this year's UN Day theme for the 77th anniversary is Nourishing Peace, which focuses on the intersection of food security and peace around the world. This is a hybrid program, so you could join us at the Carbondale Public Library at 7 p.m., or you could attend virtually on Zoom. And I think it's appropriate at this time that we thank the Carbondale P Public Library and Jennifer Robertson for facilitating all of our Zoom programs. So thank you very much. On Tuesday, November 8th, we are, our program is going to be quite fascinating. It is the findings of the SIU campus climate survey. Dr. Sheila Caldwell, Chief Diversity Officer for the SIU system, and Dr. Paul Frazier, Vice Chancellor for Anti-Racism, Diversity and Inclusion at SIUC, 
will discuss the findings of a survey administered to faculty, staff, students, and administrators, which aim to access perceptions about sense of belonging, political and religious views, safety, bias incidents, and access to resources. Now, this will be a Zoom program, and it will begin at 7 p.m., and we hope that you'll all join us for that. On Tuesday, December 13th, Coming to America is our topic. Chan S. San will share his experiences and adventures as a young man who at the age of 20 came to North America searching for a better life. His hardships and adventures on the journey were described in the book, Crossing the Mekong. This will be an in-person meeting, which we're excited about, to be held at the faculty house at 7 p.m. And we know it will be a very inspiring message. On Tuesday, January 17th, how to survive in turbulent times with AAUW values. And we all can agree we have had turbulent times. Paula Perdue, public policy co-chair for AAUW Illinois, will review AAUW's public policy priorities, develop awareness of how to advocate for these issues at the state and federal level, and guide us through the process of reaching out to our elected officials in support of AAUW priorities. This will be a virtual program at 7 p.m. Tuesday, February 14th, Valentine's Day and also February Black History Month. Our topic will be Finding Africa, the history of free black settlements in Southern Illinois. Attorney Kimberly France, a descendant of free African-American pioneers, wanted to know more about a place referred to as up in the country, where she attended family reunions and funerals in the 1960s and 70s. Subsequent family genealogical research has revealed several previously unrecognized settlements of African-American people in Southern Illinois. This will be an in-person meeting at the African American Museum at 7 p.m. Tuesday, March 21st, Title IX, the next 50 years. Join Charlotte West in a discussion of the future of Title IX. Will it take another 50 years to reach full compliance? This will be a Zoom program at 7 p.m. Tuesday, April 11th, the Donna Randolph Art Program. Students from area schools will have the option of participating in our annual art competition and receiving prizes for their award-winning entries. Enjoy commentary and an exhibit by local artist Marie Samuel. This will be in person and we will be announcing the location soon. We're looking forward to having the students with us again. We haven't been able to do this for several years. For this, this will be an exciting evening. And finally, Tuesday, May 9th, celebrating our year's achievements. Enjoy dinner at a local restaurant and recognize our branch scholarship recipients while learning more about the women for whom the scholarships were named. Meet our new members also. This will be an in-person meeting at 6 p.m. So we invite you to mark your calendars and participate in all of these AAUW programs. Thank you for being with us tonight. Sarah Faye. Thank you so much for attending this evening. Cindy, thank you. That was very educational, very personal, very heartfelt. We enjoyed and we would love to hear more from you in the future as well. And thank you everybody for joining us this evening. We appreciate your attending and uh, keep in mind for the uh, future for several of our other programs and do attend with us.